Today has just been one of those tinkery days. It's just one of those days where I had a bunch of stuff to get to, done that wasn't very interesting. Um, and I just kind of knocked it all out. Like I had to work on trying to fix the oil leak for the Miata, changing the dipstick tube to a stock one, thread sealing bolts, etc. I went through and organized all my car parts and rearranged them and got my shelves all nice and reorganized because it was just becoming a mess over here and I did my OCD, it drives me nuts. So I've got a shelf, full shelf for the GC8, two empty bins for it. Got my Miata shelf with everything sorted and organized, my Z slash random stuff shelf, and then my way too big to fit on these shelves shelf. And as much as these days are kind of tough because it's not really anything to film and it, you know, it's not very stimulating, it is really satisfying at the end when you're done and you, have taken care of all this crap that you've been putting off for a long time. So, I figured instead of filming a boring vlog today, what a better day than to film a q and I haven't done one in a while, I really enjoy the Q&As. Um, I'm very talkative and I like to answer all of your questions, so I should probably do them live, but we'll do kind of like a short as Taylor Ray can make a video, Q&A video now, because we already have a bunch of questions to answer. And there's a bunch of good ones, So and, and there's a bunch of questions that I've been getting in comments and everything, um, so it'll be good to answer all these questions. That, got the LS Miata in the background, brothers. Woo -woo. There, okay, that should be good. Okay, a lot of common questions, a lot of the same question. Uh, one of the bigger ones is, are you gonna do a video on how much it costs to do the LS swap in the Miata? Yes, I've been saying it since day one. You know, the whole goal of this build was to do the swap for under 10 grand. Uh, so we are absolutely gonna make a video with every nut, bolt, fitting, everything of how much it costs to do that swap. I do think some people are confused and think that I meant we are gonna build a whole car for 10 grand and they're like, there's no way, and there is no way. I mean, because the car has literally changed everything. But as far as the swap goes, I think we're under the 10 grand budget. I have to add it all up, which is why I haven't done the video yet. I just, I wanted to wait till it was done. Um, and now it's not, you know, there's still a few things left to do, but all those parts are ordered. I know how much everything costs. I just have to add it up and make a video on it. So we will do a video on how much the swap itself costs to swap the motor trans and diff because that's all part of the swap and then how much kind of like the rest of the build costs and we'll even go into how much I got the car for and the parts I sold to make profit and all that stuff. So like kind of how much I have into the car total. Uh, so I think that'll be a really interesting video. I'm really excited to make it um, and it is coming, I promise. Hopefully within a couple days. I just gotta sit down and tally everything up and I just, I don't wanna miss anything. So I, yeah, I really need to take my time with it. Another question that was super common, crap, what? was it oh japan plans now that grant has your bought your jzx um and there was another one like why did he buy it and why did you sell it uh so i had the car um it was in storage i got my gold car which meant i could go back for two more trips um and at the time the trips came around i just i didn't really have the funds to do it comfortably you know i could have scratched together all the money i had and made it happen but then i would have been broke and i didn't want to put myself in that position again uh it just wouldn't have been fun to go and do it while knowing that you know, I'm putting off a lot of adult things at home and taking money away from things that I really need to spend the money on to better my life and my future. Uh, and that's kind of still where I'm at now and where I was at when Grant needed the car. He had booked his trip, he had paid for pretty much everything and he just could not find a car. It was able to help him out, you know, and get him a car so he didn't have to go for, you know, to not drive. And then, you know, help me out because I didn't have to keep paying storage fees on the car, I got my money back out of it, and all that stuff. So it just made sense at the time, and I think if I were to go back, that's kind of like a weird thing, because if I were to go back, like part of, you know, I wanna buy a beat up car and just go thrash and just bang doors and not care, you know, a car that I do not care if I ride it off. On the other hand, then you might end up not driving because it's gonna be a piece of crap. And on the other hand, if I do go back to Japan, when I do, I will go back. When I go back to Japan, I wanna be able to do it comfortably. I don't want it to be, okay, well I can finish building the shop behind this house that I just bought, or I can go to Japan, you know, and have to pick between those two. I want it to be like, I can go to Japan, it's not gonna hurt me in any other aspect of my life. Because I'm really trying to get my stuff together and, and save up to buy a house, I've been putting money away, I've been, it hurts me every time I spend money, but like I, you ha I have to, you know, but I've been really trying to get all that sorted. And I, I feel like it's kind of foolish for me to go spend the money to go to Japan when I don't even own a house yet. You know, it just doesn't make sense. The older I get, the more I realize these things. So that's pretty much where I'm at with Japan. I love Japan, I wanna go back, um, but now it's just not the time. Would a four x four be on the budget build list? Yes, uh, kind of a spoiler, but I'd really like to build a Samurai, Suzuki Samurai, if I built anything or like a tracker or something weird like that. 
Um, but maybe we do like some old school, just typical like mud bog truck, like old Ford or something. I don't know. I don't know. But yes, uh, budget builds going to cover all spectrums. I want to do everything. <laughs> this, is the, this is kind of a follow up question. How long do you expect to be in your current house with them before you buy your own house slash shop? I'm not sure. It's kind of a weird situation because I don't know. I couldn't necessarily, I could do it now. I could probably make it happen now. I could at least buy the house, um, but I want to have enough money to buy the house with, you know, a down payment, a normal down payment, and have the money to build, you know, like a 30 by 40 shop or something. And like I said, I have been stacking money away as hard as I can. But the thing is, I am not comfortable buying a house right now with the way YouTube is. You know, I don't know. Tomorrow, everyone can stop watching my videos and then I own a house and I have a mortgage and what am I gonna do for money? I know I'd figure it out, um, but for me, it's like, I wanna get I wanna get it all together more. You know, I wanna have another revenue stream, you know, fallback sources. I wanna be a lot further along than I am right now before I commit to buying a house. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. I really don't know. It could take a year. My goal is kind of like a year uh, and maybe more, maybe less. I don't know. How has doing YouTube full-time fared? Is it currently sustainable? It is sustainable, especially with uh, my Patreon supporters. You guys are like, such an amazing help, those of you watching. Really, really great community on there, and it, it has helped me out a ton. That support like literally directly helped me every single month. So between that and YouTube, uh, views have been up. It's like we'll start to dip down, and then like we'll get a couple good videos and bring them back up for the month, and we're doing good. We're doing... It's sustainable. I just... <sighs> I like I said, with the house thing and stuff, I'm just in a tough spot with the budget builds because like I have to get rid of them, you know, to afford the next one and to make it sustainable because if I just built cars and kept them, I would spend all the money that I make on YouTube that I need to spend on living expenses on cars. So I have to find some sort of rhythm where I can build a car, enjoy it, you know, and then get rid of it, get my money back out of it, move on. Um, and that's really the plan with the budget builds, but I'm already failing because I want to keep the GC8, which there was a question about the GC8, what are the plans now that the Miata is basically done, which it's kind of a two-part answer. It is basically done. Yes, there are a few more things to do. Like we have about a week's worth of work. If we had all the parts, like we got to build a handbrake handle, run handbrake lines, get all that set up. We got to do power steering line, seats, harnesses, uh, body kit. I got to take that to paint. We have that. I mean, there, there's a handful of things more to do, but we are going to be starting on GC8 very soon. Um, my plan is to rewire the whole car, obviously paint the car, full suspension. I'm going to go through the engine. I want to pull it out, do a clutch, uh, do belts, you know, seals and all that. I just, I really want to make that car solid and dialed and that would be kind of stage one of the build. And then stage two, someone had a really good idea and said I should try kind of like the sloppy mechanics, but like Subaru style. So what he does is push the limits of stock stuff, finds failure points, kind of fixes them with cheap stuff, tries you know, cheap injectors or this or that, and it just finds the limits of stuff. And that to me sounds really cool. You know, buy eBay connecting rods and some race bearings and see if, you know, we can push it to 400 horsepower and, and make it a learning experience, you know, and, and figure it out along the way. And it's going to be a lot of work to pull the motor in and out when I blow it up. But I don't know. That's kind of my idea for phase two. If I keep it, I, I don't know. I really don't know. Things change so much. I don't know why I'm going that far into the future because you never know what's going to happen with me. My mind is like, here, here, oh, there, over there, over there. I own an FD spec car, would you? I mean, yes, if I could afford to drive it. Um, I feel like a lot of people get wrapped up in having a car at that level, and then they have it, and then they barely drive it because they can't afford to drive it because those cars are very expensive to drive between fuel, you know, wear and tear, tires, you know, you're spending almost 200 bucks a tire on tires and then you're going through them in a couple laps because the car makes so much power it just gets exponentially more expensive to drive and, and use and to me in my experience it doesn't get exponentially more fun i've never driven like an fd level car but i've driven you know pro-am pro two level cars and it it's not that much more fun than like tandeming in the z all right we're getting into some drama now i know this is what you guys are here for drama 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 you guys love drama. <laughs> so I saw a bunch of comments about this on one of my videos and then I didn't really think about it. And then I saw the comments and like commenting on the comments and it was just so many ignorant comments on there. And then I had to like do some research and, and look into it a little bit. So here's the question. You hear what FBI said in his recent Q and A, something like his car would smash yours on a road course. Would your build be a challenge worthy? If you don't know FBI's build, it's like a K20 swap or something like that. So this is why I feel the need to weigh in because I saw a couple comments like, 
the only thing Taylor has going for him is power to weight. Or Tommy has $35,000 in his car. There's no way he wouldn't beat Taylor. And that is really just not the case. Based on the comments, I mean, I didn't go back and watch all his videos to find out what's done to his car. Uh, but based on the comments, his car makes 170 wheel horsepower. Someone said it re dynoed over 200, I don't know. It's got the fancy billet drop knuckles, it's got coilovers, it's got bushings, and it's got sway bars, and it's got, you know, big tires, and it's set up for the track. Well, my car uh, makes about 320 wheel horsepower. We'll have to dyno it to know for sure, but it's definitely over 300. It can't really be under that unless something's wrong. Fab drop knuckles instead of billet drop knuckles, has all polyurethane bushings, has sway bars, and is set up for drifting. So yes, the setups are different. Just because my car is set up for drifting does not make it not uncapable as a track car. The things you do to your suspension to make a car a good drift car are not very different from making a car a good track car. If you're building a tube chassis, then probably, yeah. But if you're modifying a stock car, you're gonna use pretty much all the same parts to make the car better because it's gonna be better for track or for drifting if it handles better. The only thing that really changes between the two is setup. So spring rate, valving, uh, tire, alignment, etc. On paper, suspension-wise, we have pretty much all the same parts. His car just has more expensive versions of those parts. So I don't think that more expensive versions of the same essential parts are going to make his car double the power to weight faster. There's just no way. It is just not possible if we're talking about a real track here. I mean, a car literally, if his car makes 170 horsepower, makes double the power to weight. His only justification for saying that was that my car makes too much power and that is too much power for the chassis and it would be undrivable and his car, you know, is much more drivable because it makes less power. And while yes, that is true to an extent, this car with the amount of power it makes is completely drivable. It is insane how well it grips. If you roll into it hard and first from, you know, a 10 mile an hour roll, it will completely hook from first on. Uh, obviously you can make it spin if you stab first and clutch kick in a second, but it hooks with 205s. So if I change to 245s, set my spring rates up for road racing, there's no reason why my car would not demolish it. It's because again, it has basically all of the same stuff and double the power. So I, I don't know. His comment kind of irked me because he was so cocky about the fact that his car would for sure beat mine um, with having seemingly zero knowledge of what was done to my car. This is not me trying to stab at him. I'm just kind of trying to figure out why in his head, his car with half the power to weight and basically the same suspension mods would be drastically faster than my car. It's just, to me, it doesn't make any sense. But regardless, he said he'd be willing to throw down so we can go to the Dragon. That's what he wants to do. I like, I'm down, I'll do it because whatever, but I don't think that's a good place for the test. Like if you actually wanna see which car is faster, it doesn't really make sense because the Dragon, you're mostly limited by knowledge of the corners, where you're going, you know, if you know it very well or not. Um, and two, just like fear of dying. You know, it's, it's basically you're limited not ever by the car, but by how close to dying you're willing to get. You know, even in like a stock Miata, you're probably gonna hang back, you're hold, gonna hold back a little bit. So I think we'd be better off going to like a real track and doing time laps and seeing which car is actually faster on a road course. As long as we're talking about a road course and not an autocross here, because that kind of changes the whole dynamic. An autocross, you can't really use any power anyway. So I have no idea at that point. Maybe his car would be faster on autocross, but like a real big boy racetrack there's no reason why my car would not demolish his. Um, but again, we'll find out. So comment below, let me know what you guys think. Do you think we should do it at the Dragon? Or do you think it makes more sense to go to a track? Maybe we should do both. I don't know. I think it'd be fun though. Moving on, let's go back to uh, normal questions. Having done an LS swap, would you ever do a Jay-Z swap? I absolutely wanna do a Jay-Z swap. I wanna do a 2J in something. They are sick engines. They are amazing, they sound sick, they feel rad, like they are so cool. I absolutely wanna do a Jay-Z. Uh, I also want to do a uh, Turbo LS. I want to do a lot of things. That is the whole point of the budget build. So I can kind of like get all these builds out of my system, figure out not only which builds I like, but which motorsports I like, and to have fun building a bunch of different cars that I've always wanted to build. I actually have a reason to do it. It's a good excuse, right? Ooh, do you ever feel like you didn't properly see a build through because of either change of plans or lack of resources? Absolutely. I had a S14 with RB25 and it gave me tons of issues for like two years that I owned that I modified everything else and the engine, it was either I had problems with the turbo kit or the engine or the transmission or whatever. I just nonstop problems with that car. So I pulled the motor out, I traded it for a car, I was going to sell the car and buy an LS swap, 
sold the car and up pops up a 2.2 board sleeved SR cams standalone precision turbo like baller setup uh, so I jumped on it I bought it I stripped the car down I painted the bay I got it all back together I got it running and I just I needed about three grand I needed money for a tune I needed money to upgrade the trans I needed money for coilovers and like angle kit and stuff and that car would have been sick but timing resources and money none of that was there so I did have to give up on that build and I sold it to some guy so I think parted it out or something I think they parted it out in Texas which is interesting because I saw the guy like some point this year and he was like oh remember me I bought your old car with the 2.2 SR in it and I was like what that's crazy he's like yeah it's in this other car like still running so that was pretty cool I, I do that is one that I regret like having to give up on because I put a lot, of, that was the first car I put a lot of time into because I finally had a job where I had the money to modify the car instead of just trading for the next car that had the thing I wanted. Um, so that was, that was kind of tough. That was kind of tough. Would you do a Euro budget build if so a car to be? Oh yeah, I have tons that I want to do. I want to do a Turbo N52 E30. I want to do E36 track car. I want to do like a bagged Benz maybe a bag BMW or something like that. I want to do one of the crazy OM606 diesel swaps and like an old Mercedes wagon makes like 600 horsepower. It is a lot I want to do. Definitely, they're on the list. Does your Miata still feel like a Miata or does it feel heavy but fast? It does not feel heavy. You do not notice the 100 to 200 pounds weight difference. I mean, if you think about it, that's the difference between me having been in the passenger seat or not. You know what I mean? Like one person in the passenger seat is the weight difference between what it was and what it is. We have to weigh it to be 100% sure, but yeah, no, not at all. It still feels like a Miata with an LS in it, which is nuts. That, that part of why I was like so mind blown when I first drove it, because I was like, oh my God, this feels like what I expected it to feel like. It was not at all let down. Okay, this is probably super long, so I'm gonna start wrapping it up. Let's see. When are you taking a trip to the West Coast with the truck and trailer? When the Miata's done, uh, you know, my goal is, you know, get it figured out, work out all the grim ones, make sure she's reliable, and then start taking trips, either one big trip or like a bunch of small trips probably, you know, and go out west and go up north and, and hit up all the different drift communities around the country with that car. That is my plan. Of all drift cars, why choose an MX-5 Miata? Okay, this is a good one because we'll end on this one because Tommy also said that he thinks that Miatas are a poor choice for a drift car. So... The reason for a Miata, it's an interesting choice and it, it shouldn't be everybody's choice, but it is my choice. The reason I chose a Miata for myself is because the way that car is built, it should be able to keep up with basically Pro-Am level cars that are running, you know, 255 R comp, sticky tires, you know, making five, 600 horsepower, but with a lot less. My car and Ben's car handle with like all season tires, they're pretty fast with like a 200 horsepower turbo motor and all season tires, you can keep up with a lot of people. So with over 300 and R comp tires, the car should be pretty fast in drift, um, but while still being affordable. And that's the biggest thing. It's the goal of that car is to straddle the two lines between having a crazy car that's sick and you can link all these big fast tracks and you can keep up with the fast cars um, and having a car that's affordable to drive because you usually can't get both. And I think that car is gonna wind up right in the middle where it'll still be decently affordable to drive, but also be like sick and rowdy and ratchet to drive. And that's due to it's lightweight, smaller tires and all that stuff. You know, you can't get away with that on a heavier car. You wouldn't be able to get as much grip out of the smaller tires. And this chassis, the suspension design, makes a lot of mechanical grip. Like Miata's are just naturally fast in drift. Um, so that's how you can keep up with so much less, if that makes sense. So the other reasons for Miata is Miatas are very snappy because they are a short wheelbase car. Um, and some people think that's a bad thing. And it is a bad thing if you don't know how to drift um, or if you're new to drifting or if you're super used to a car that's not snappy. But snappy cars are great for tandem because what when you're tandeming, you're following somebody, when you go to transition, if you want to stay on their door, you need to start transitioning before them so that as they come through, you're able to get right back on their door. The nice thing about a Miata unlike the Z, like the Z is a very slow car to transition. It kind of just wanders its way through the transition. You can make it go a little faster, but it's gonna take you a second to make it from one direction to the other. The Miata, snap. You can transition that car so quick, and that is so nice in tandem. You see, oh, they're transitioning, right? You can transition and be right back on them. Um, it's just a very nimble car in drift. And once you get the hang of it, they're solid. I really like them. 
very curious to see how it is with this setup. You know, obviously I haven't drifted it yet. So, you know, I mean, I will reserve my full thoughts until then, but I think it's gonna be pretty sick. So anyway, that's gonna be it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed the Q&A. If you have any other questions or comments, concerns on what we've talked about, let me know in the comments. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.